Rebecca Linder, welcome to Partnering Leadership. I'm thrilled to have you in this conversation with me. Mahan, thank you for having me. It's a, a privilege and honor. Such an exciting time for us to be talking to you. Having led your organization's events management uh, organization through what has been one of the most disruptive experiences in all of our lives, but most especially your industry also, Rebecca, but would love to start out first with your upbringing. Whereabouts did you grow up and how did that upbringing impact the kind of person you've become? It's a great question. So I, I am the product of a an American father and a Jamaican mother who was born and raised in Jamaica. And my father was a foreign service officer and met her there. Um, at which point they moved around a bit. I'm the youngest of three. And I was born in West Africa and then went on to Brussels and to the Middle East uh, in Jordan and then came to the U.S. for the first time when I was about seven and then left again for Greece where I went to high school and then they went off to Madrid when I came back here to Cod. So it's, I'm this amalgamation of cultures and religions and, you know, um, countries um, in the most beautiful way, actually. And um, my parents did a tremendous job of making sure we really took advantage of those opportunities and, and a real immersion into those cultures. What a wonderful opportunity to see and live in those different cultures, Rebecca. How did that shape you when you experienced these different cultures, different countries, different foods, different people while growing up? Yeah, I think it shaped me in several ways. I think the first of which it created a very open-minded person over here because I was always other in all these countries, including my own here in the US, because my experiences were so different. It really created this level of tolerance and understanding that has been very useful for me and, and has helped me kind of bridge really difficult conversations and, and be able to, and, and create a tremendous amount of curiosity um, for you know, meeting people and, and understanding their perspectives and, and, and not limiting them to what they say, but understanding where they're coming from. Because I, you know, so I'm I also highly tolerant um, of different perspectives because I think, you know, they're so, varied in how they're influenced and then of course it taught me courage right because I was dropped in into all these little places <laughs> and having to sort of fend my way without the right language culture look feel and so it taught me a tremendous about my own sort of sense of who I am and how I wanted to show up. So you uh, gained an appreciation for all cultures but did one of them resonate with you or stay with you more than the others? You know, it's interesting. I have two experiences. One, the Mediterranean culture, I think, is so familiar to me because my mother is sort of, you know, a very hot-blooded Jamaican and sort of the Mediterranean culture <laughs> has that, both that casual, you know, yaman, sit back, as well as that really intense, you know, familial, cultural piece that I actually really love and enjoy. So that was very resonant for me. I think actually my biggest challenge was always coming back to the U.S which is always fascinating. So the two inflection points were when I was seven, which was really tough. And it was the first time I'd come to the country, even though it's my country of origin. And then again at 18, when I came back for college, those were my biggest transitions, um, uh, which was really interesting because that was not the expectation. So how were you able to adjust, especially at 18 when you came to college and you went to Boston University? You know, I think both at seven and 18, I kind of did the same thing and, and I, there was a version of it in these other places as well. But when I got here, I realized very quickly that somehow, even though I was really from the U.S., there was a, an exotic component to me that was not actually particularly attractive, right? It was an interesting, but it wasn't relatable because so many people that I was around were from where they were from. And so I found myself sort of dimming my light a little bit around that aspect of me and sort of trying to be a bit of more of a chameleon in terms of you know, what was comfortable for people, but quickly realized that, you know, a quick immersion into these places was the way to do it, which again, is sort of, and I'm a highly social introvert, even though I come off as an extrovert. So it takes a lot out of my tank to just jump in, but I've done it every time, right? I got involved in clubs and sports and, you know, ran for office, those kinds of things, whenever I started as a way to sort of say, hey, here I am. And, you know, it's interesting uh, for me also growing up, 
at times I think it makes the question, where are you from? Something you have to take a step back and <laughs> makes it a lot uh, more complex than the typical intention of the question. Correct. Correct. I have that all the time. So I understand fully. So but why it was did also you... an opportunity, though, to reinvent yourself every time, too, which was really great because you could sort of peel off the layers that didn't appeal and kind of reestablish yourself as this new version, too, every time you moved. So there was a big advantage in it as well. Interesting. I, I, what is one way you did that, Rebecca, reinvented yourself? You know, when I, I mean, I've done it from, a month, you know, nicknames to kind of getting back to my actual full name, Rebecca. I mean, that was a big one when I transferred from Greece to, to the U.S. Um, I think sides of my personality that I just, you know, were pieces that people were getting accustomed to and I wanted to be taken a little bit more seriously. So as we made these changes, I could, you know, I could divest myself of some aspects of who I was perceived as to who I wanted to be. So there was a, a tremendous opportunity there for me as well. So why did you study, decide to study political science? Probably because I didn't know any better, actually. I was a poli-sci <laughs> econ major with an acting minor. And I, you know, my family is very political in, in terms of both opinion and an interest. And um, I think I actually just wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And, and probably midway through, I would have done something more like English Lit or... Um, something a little bit more artful because that's really where my passion lies. Uh, African-American uh, history would have been a great interest of mine. Art is a great interest of mine, but I was able to channel a lot of that because I was too lazy to sort of extend my college for another year to switch majors. So I ended up focusing on the acting as a way to draw out the more creative side of me. Well, you say you were lazy to extend it for a year. Many would say you were smart not to well, take on another year of debt to correct. go to a fifth year of college. So a little bit of both. A little, there's some laziness <laughs> there as well. So uh, while in college, you wanted to become an actor. What had that passion? Had you uh, done acts and uh, shows and theater throughout high school and college. What got you to want to become an actor? So it's interesting. So no is the answer in terms of high school. I had never done any acting. I've, I'd always been thrilled by poetry and plays and read a lot, but I never, you know, put myself on stage. I had put myself in other positions of, you know, class president and these kinds of visible components, but I don't know. I, I ended up seeing uh, a play being advertised, an Edward Albee play, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to do this in college. And I thought, oh, you know, and then, you know, I'm one to get myself out of my comfort zone a little bit. So I thought, oh, this will be interesting. And I, while I threw up before I got on stage every time, <laughs> I absolutely loved both the intensity and the pressure of it, and also just the idea that it was such an easy way to draw out emotions that I typically wouldn't deal with myself. Um, but because you had to immerse yourself in the character, you were able to draw them out in a way that I actually really enjoyed. And it was probably the first time I started to navigate who I was really internally um, in an interesting way. What an interesting perspective, Rebecca. You had the opportunity to tap into your authentic emotions more so on stage playing others than you had the opportunity to do so in real life. Yeah, you know, I think and that, to some degree, I still have to, and I do a lot of somatic work now, which was so not a part of my universe back then. And I think, you know, I was so, I'm such a doer and I'm very task oriented and goal oriented. And I just, and I didn't know the language or the narrative around how to do that. It just wasn't part of, you know, I'm 52. So it wasn't really part of our culture at the time, both in my household, as well as sort of the culture we all grew up in. Uh, those in the sage group and so you know this notion of like wow god okay I have sadness in here I have fear in here I have joy and creative energy and all of these big emotions who knew so so the journey so uh, then what brought you here to DC so a couple things actually I had a bit of a cancer scare so I was on my way to go to, um, after college, I went out to Seattle for the summer and I worked out there. I had a million jobs, like, you know, because I do that always. And 
I decided I wanted to, I had been accepted into a graduate program for acting and I decided to extend it a year, defer it and just spend a year out there. And so I did so and I made all this money because I had a million jobs and I was having a great time. And then I decided I was going to defer one more year because I wanted to go travel the world. And prior to that, I had gotten some physicals and I'd had a cancer scare in college. I'd had a lump removed from my breast in college. And then I ended up having... Um, another scare, uh, vaginal at this time, but another scare. And so I was gone for three months and then had to come back to DC and I had to receive treatment every three, three months uh, for a, you know, a bit of time. So I just was like, okay, what am I gonna do now? And I decided not to pursue the acting. I took a job at Arena Stage, tried to immerse myself in the world. And I realized very quickly the acting side of it wasn't really where my love was. That was just a great introduction for me emotionally. And I enjoyed a bit of it but not the core of what I loved was the, you know, ready or not, here they come at six o'clock curtain goes up and you better figure out what's going on. And that piece I really did love. So I ended up not pursuing the acting as a career and got into production. Yeah. So you started your business at 26, Rebecca. And while right now for some people listening, they think about entrepreneurs skipping college or coming right out of college to start businesses a generation back 20 years ago, people didn't necessarily think it would be wise for young people to start their own businesses. So 26, starting your own business was somewhat unusual. What got you to decide that you wanted to take this big step? You know, there's, there's so many good reasons. Ignorance is a big one, though. <laughs> Let's just be super clear and honest about, I didn't know any better. But, you know, <laughs> interestingly enough, some of the motivation around it for me, and it and I am this person to this day, is, um, you know, I, I was always very entrepreneurial as a kid. I was, and, and, and a better way to say it, and I always say this, I'm not a Wharton grad. I'm really more of a hustler than I am, a, you know, that this established business kind of, guru. Um, and while I've done quite well, it's really been kind of on my own steam. And while I was always very entrepreneurial, what I also, although this is sort of counterintuitive, I'm also require a fair amount of freedom and independence. And, um, and while I'm, you know, a slave to all my clients and have to sort of do all the things that they need us to do, um, I also find myself, you know, craving that ability and that maneuverability. And, you know, I had the opportunity presented itself very quickly. I was um, the director of operations for a big catering company in town, which was a position that they actually created for me. I started at 23. And then by that time, I was handling some of the biggest clients in town, like the Smithsonian National Gallery of Art, and really realized that that was, while food is one of my first loves, it was a very limited kind of sliver of the bigger picture. And I was like, I really like that bigger picture. I love the creativity around it. And so I just said, I'm going to do this. And I took a big leap and I also didn't like having to sort of just be in an office to be in an office just to show. I mean, if I need to work 48 hours in a row, I will do that. But if there's only 10 hours of things to do, I'm only going to do 10 hours. And um, so just philosophically, it was just like that momentum already existed in me. So when you started your business, I imagine in some from some perspectives, you already had some of the relationships to establish the business. On the other hand, as a 26 year old wanting to get large con contracts to do event management must not have been very easy. Very challenging. Where my real sort of, re I had great resources in terms of vendor relationships and partnerships. And I had some external on the client side that continued to work with me, which was very generous of them, which is why I give so much back to young people now, because I was helped in that capacity and people took a risk. But yeah, I looked, one, I looked very young. While I sounded quite pulled together, the minute they saw me and they'd have that million dollar check in their hand, they would literally not let go of it. When they were giving it to me, they're like, you look like you're 10. And I was like, I'm not, I swear to God. And you know, people had to vouch for me and say, no, this is a person who you can rely on and depend on. And um, you know, so slowly, but it was really intimidating also because you know, I'm not one who grew up asking for a lot of help and it took me quite some time, which is sort of the biggest lesson I've learned over time, um, you know, that I was just trying to do everything myself. 
And um, so it was really, it was hard in the beginning and, and really devastating to your ego, right? As you're trying to like, oh, please let the phone ring kind of thing. <laughs> but you were able to uh, start the business, succeed with it, with those relationships. And at the same time, on the personal side, Rebecca, that's when after a few years, you also had to come to grips with your sexuality and declaring your sexuality. What was that like for you? No, so that was a very big deal, um, you know, and again, it kind of taps back into the earlier conversation around I wasn't very in tune with who I was internally. And while I always had this notion that, you know, my my attraction, well, I had lots of boyfriends. And in fact, I was married. Uh, I got married when I was 29. And I got to about 34. And we were considering having children. And it felt like a very big decision, even though I knew I wanted kids. And I use that time as a time to really reflect and be introspective around actually, you know, is this a thing or not? And realizing through that process that, you know, I, 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 my, my sexual identity was truly different than how I was presenting, you know, I was gay and, and, and realized that that was an injustice to my husband. And so he and I shared that with him. And, you know, as that dissolved our marriage, we're still, good friends, which I'm so grateful for, but it was a big deal. And it wasn't just, you know, him, it was my family. It was my whole universe. I mean, I, I operated as a heterosexual all my life. And so it was an ex there was an external piece to it as well as an internal piece to it. And it was really difficult. So how did that external world, at least the external world part that you cared about, which is your family and your loved ones, how did they take it? For the most part, really well. And it's a testament to who they are. And it's also probably a testament to why I waited so long. I think, you know, I knew in my heart of hearts at that point in my life, I had everything that I needed just in case, you know, uh, it wasn't going to work out. I had a very supportive friend group. I had a very, for the most part, supportive family. You know, I was established in my business. And so, you know, I felt secure in my own right in order to be able to deliver this very big and new message to, to every, I mean, I, even my clients to some degree, you know, I had to sort of, you know, and I, it's not that I wear it on my sleeve all day long, but it just, it became, you know, known. And some people did have a challenge with it and some people didn't, and that was okay. And that goes back also to my upbringing and sort of that level of tolerance I have, it's okay for people not to agree or be okay with the choices I'm making in my life. Like, I don't want to be hindered how I get to act in my life, but I'm okay to have people not necessarily agree or even support it. It's uh, becoming comfortable with yourself and in your own skin and the people that love you will choose to love you the way you are. And Correct. if some don't choose to accept you, that's uh, fine. But what's most important is for you to present as you truly are. Correct. And it's taken me a long time, you know, yeah. And I would even say, and, you know, you fast forward a little bit into my 40s. I mean, I think, and now, you know, I have a partner at this point and we're thinking about having our own children and we started at 39 and, and, and I was 42 when the second one came. And truthfully, that was a huge turning point for me in having to identify, you know, how would I articulate my values now, right? Not only just as a human. And that was probably the moment where the most transition transformation in my life took place. And not less when I came out as gay, but more around what are actually my values that I'm going to articulate to my children. That really put me on a path that even at 52 now, I'm still on, but a really intense you know, self-reflection and uh, self-improvement and self-development. It's difficult for all of us, Rebecca, to do that. But what you mentioned is that self-reflection is what's important as a first step. Different people yeah. have to do it in their own way. But it's a, it's a hard process to go through when you think about passing on what you believe to be the right values to your kids. It, no, very much so. And, and it's, and it is, it, you know, for me, it isn't even the right values. It was just sort of what are my values so that I could articulate to my children to give them opportunity and curiosity around what they might want as their own. Um, but that reflection and introspection, you know, is hard because it also brings up, 
you know, that shadowy side of you that you don't like to deal with and you put over here. And it also made me realize that I had to find new meaning even in my businesses and, and in my relationships. Like I had to redefine how I connected to things that were important to me in order to kind of continue feeling passionate and enthusiastic about it. So as you were going through this process, you also mentioned uh, uh, meeting up with your partner, you wanted to have children, and you decided on having children, you have to. How did that process work for you with your partner? Yeah, so that was very interesting. So at the time, my partner and I were together, um, you know, we, the gay marriage was not an option. And so, but we knew we wanted to have children. So um, she was a little older than I was. So at the time, Shady Grove insisted that, you know, she would use a donor egg. So I turned out to be the donor egg for her and we anonymous uh, sperm donor. And then I used my own eggs. We went through an in vitro process twice and with the same uh, sperm donor. So the children are uh, biologically 100%. But what was interesting about this scenario is I had to adopt my son uh, that my partner had, and then she had to adopt our daughter, even though, you know, we were 100% the parents. And at the time, which was really interesting, I mean, we went through the full adoption process twice. So the home, you know, interviews and the home inspections and deep into our finances and our friend network and family background. And at the, as this was happening, there was this big story in the foster care system where this woman had killed these two foster kids and put them in her freezer. And I'm sitting here going, how come she's not getting a home inspection? What, what, what's happening on this end? But, and then, you know, and it got down right down to the wire. I remember this with my son, who's the oldest. We were going into the courtroom and our lawyer at the time said, listen, the judge that's been assigned to us isn't particularly friendly towards, you know, uh, gay people. And therefore, I looked at her, I was like, you need to tell me we've gone through all of this. And there's like a threat of this not being like signed and okayed. And she was like, there's always that. And it really instantly taught me a lesson about how vulnerable we are to these external factors. And we're seeing, of course, that today in so many ways, but it really, it really taught me a lesson. And of course, I was so angry. Um, but Thankfully, they signed the paperwork and I behaved in the courtroom. Um, but, um, yeah, it was a really vulnerable moment. I'm, I'm happy to hear that it all worked out. But just to put it in context, Rebecca, this is about a dozen years ago. So we are not mm -hmm. talking about decades back. Right. Yeah, no, only 12 years. And at the same time, it was also interesting when the kids, we had to get special dispensation for, for instance, when my partner had my son, I had to like get special dispensation to stay at the hospital because it technically it can only be really family. And I, because I wasn't officially married or in any capacity, even though these were my children and my life, I wasn't even able to stay in the hospital. So, you know, thankfully they were very progressive in their thinking, but it really made you aware like, wow. And that wasn't that long ago. But that's also why I think Rebecca, it's important for stories like yours to be told because it's uh, easy for us to very quickly forget how far we have come and how hard we have to work to maintain that yeah. progress. As you mentioned, we can very easily revert back if we don't appreciate the steps that have been taken, the sacrifices that have been made to bring us to the point that we are at at this point. So you're fortunate to have had this strong relationship, have your kids. You've also done some magnificent things with respect to the events that you have coordinated, including couple that are landmarks and historical in the greater Washington DC region. And I take a lot of pride in, let alone I imagine you take tremendous pride in. One of them was the grand opening of the Smithsonian's African American History and Cultural Museum. What was that experience like for you? For me, that was such an interesting journey. I mean, I was, first of all, so privileged and honored to have been selected. And we were selected three years in advance of the opening to consult on sort of the vision around it and then hired to then implement uh, the series of events and working a lot alongside Lonnie Bunch and his team was truly 
just transformative for me as a person, but also as a company. And my own history, you know, if you go down into the museum, you'll see it. It starts in the kingdom of Benin, which is where I was actually uh, born. It was Dahomey at the time, but it was Benin where I was born. And, you know, and then it goes to the Afro Caribbean, which of course is part of my culture as well. So for me, it was a personal journey as well as um, sort of a highlight of my career to be able to support something that I felt so strongly about and to work with such thoughtful and introspective and smart, brilliant people bringing this museum to life. I mean, it was really um, a really emotional experience for me as well as just a, a moment of great pride. And it is a source of pride for not just this region, for the entire world. country, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, the world beyond so many visitors Every day, uh, I often bike by down uh, the museum, the lines of people, hordes of people going in and coming out and getting a better appreciation of that history. You also uh, had a magnificent uh, role. I saw it again in person, and there are beautiful pictures uh, for people that want to look up in celebrating the 50th anniversary uh, of the Apollo program with projections on the Washington Monument, which was magnificent. What was that experience like and how did you come up with all the plans and designs around that? Well, it was, it was a Herculean effort by many, many people and was spearheaded by the Air and Space Museum. And we came on as their logistics partner. And it was it truly, it, it, it was also an incredible experience. And what's interesting about all of these events that we do that are so meaningful to me is often tied to the fact is that these moments bring together people of disparate cultures, religions, political affiliations, race, creed, and otherwise. And to me, and, and can feel pride around accomplishment and achievement and around something that they can agree on. And to me, that is where transformation lies. And really what we do from a convening perspective is we try to align ourselves with moments that are really gonna make people come out on the other side better and, 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 and broader. And that's what I take most pride in. And that's what both of those events represented for me. Yeah, and for the audience, we will link in the show notes to both some of the images and some of the video clips uh, from that. It's just magnificent what was uh, done in that celebration. So you have this business thriving on the family side, have the kids, things are going really well, <laughs> which is great. Uh, however, uh, two years ago, more than two years ago, we get hit with COVID, which has impacted everyone's life in one way, shape, form, or another. At the same time, your business is all about convening people, bringing them together. And the first thing with the lockdown was people shouldn't be together. So tell me first about those initial days, Rebecca, and then how you started trying to handle what was a new experience for all of us. You know, it, and it's what's interesting about this. So on really March 13th, everything closed down. And on March 14th, I was turning 50. So these two things kind of came together for me in a very, very interesting way. Um, so we were keeping our eye, obviously, really as of December, January, we started to sort of feel kind of what was happening. And by February, I was like, this is going to be a big, big problem. And then March 13th came and really everyone, that was it. My kids were out of school at that point. You know, businesses were shutting, events were closing up and we had big events. It was actually slated to be our biggest and most successful spring ever, uh, as well as the biggest and best year ever in the company. And, you know, one by one, as things started to either be pushed initially because people thought, oh, this will only be for two weeks. And I suspected that was not the case. Um, and by April 1st, I started to make some decisions around, I was almost 34 people in the company and we ended up by that September being down to almost just 11, um, which was actually one of the bigger staff from an event company perspective nationwide, because I was a part of this big cohort of people who were talking weekly to figure out what was happening as well as locally. 
So, you know, it was very difficult. And, I, you know, in addition to having to make difficult decisions, I also had to make sure my team felt supported and stable in my vision um, and our clients as well, that we could navigate for this for them successfully. And it took a tremendous amount of time and lift to do that. Um, and to help them get knowledgeable about what their opportunities were. Thankfully, we had that virtual experience already, but there were so many platforms and different ways of dealing with technology that was coming to the forefront. I had a team just solely dedicated to just keeping up with the technology, uh, but a lot of time spending, you know, um, keeping everyone sort of, con and confirming to the client that we were, we were um, solid as an organization, right? We were viable as a company and they could trust us to, continue on. And what is interesting about COVID, as difficult as it was, it actually kind of drew on what I do best. It was sort of drew on my, not just my expertise, but really on my genius in a way that was really surprising and also great for me because I was getting to a point before COVID hit a little bit of, I felt a little rudderless as the CEO of this company, like, where does it want to go? What does it want to do? And COVID really gave me the opportunity to reinvent the organization. And I had just brought on in 2019, a new COO who also what was great about COVID for us is that it really defined our two roles um, and highlighted where our strengths were. So she really took over at that point on the day-to-day -day and I took on sort of more of the vision and where are we going piece. Um, so while very difficult and 2020 was a real bust from a business perspective and revenues and all of that, we were able in 2021 to do actually quite well and build back um, and not to what we were, but really I should say build forward to what, who we want to be aspirationally. And it's a very different company. And now, so you know, I, we're over 20. Yeah. So I, I wonder, Rebecca, as you look at the events and gathering space moving forward, now that to a certain extent, people are more comfortable congregating there's still a lack of comfort there are still issues to be addressed would love to know your thoughts and perspectives with respect to you said uh not only your organization is better off to a certain extent as a result of what you experienced but you are doing things differently as a result of what we've experienced over the past couple of years what are you doing differently and how do you see the event space and the gatherings changing as a result of what we experienced? You know, I, I actually think COVID has had a positive impact on how people will convene in the future and has required us to take what I consider to be a stagnant, stagnant model pr prior to COVID into a much more thoughtful model going forward. And we do have a consultative side to the business that was very active during COVID working with our clients across their event portfolios to really think about strategically what made sense kind of coming out of COVID. And the reality is, and you're seeing this just in the workforce, right? People don't want to go back full-time to their offices. They don't want to travel once a month to uh, events and conferences around or, or, you know, stakeholder meetings. You know, there's a new version of how people want to engage. And I think they're more discriminant and have a, and have a higher expectation of what the value proposition is going to be for them. And as a result, I think it makes it really interesting. And so I think three things are happening. One is I think we've gone from experiential economy, whether people know it or not in terms of events to people want transformation. They wanna to go to something and come out transformed in some way. And I think it's our obligation to provide that, number one. I think number two, making sure um, you know, that these, the expectation around the experience itself is also raised. Um, I think, again, if people are going to be away from their family, friends, and otherwise to take the time to travel, you know, the expectation um, of how they participate is also different. So transformation is one thing, but they also want to be part of the conversation. So, right, this is no longer about people from the stage speaking. This is about facilitation. How do you draw out the experts in the room? How do you get genius from your audience and not as participants, not as sitting around listening to a bunch of people. So I think that's the other piece of it. And I think thirdly, you know, providing just an opportunity for a meaningful connection um, to their peer network in a way that I think we've kind of forgot. So. 
Rebecca, I'm going to ask everyone to listen and re-listen and re-listen to what you just said these last three, four minutes in that that is the challenge a lot of organizations have in their return to office. And a lot of events have now that we are in this uh, post initial phases of COVID era, whatever you want to call it. I've attended events where to them, it's almost like nothing happened over the past two years. Still, the panelists sit on the stage and I'm asking myself, wait a minute, even though there was no traffic, I drove 45 minutes to sit here to watch something on stage that I could have just as easily clicked my Zoom meeting. Not that I would have watched it anymore on Zoom anyway. <laughs> but no, true. It, but that is in the back of my mind. So you mentioned people uh, want to move from experiential to transformation. Now, I want to understand that a little bit better. I want to touch on each and every one of the items you mentioned, because I think there is so much wisdom in there, both for gathering people, whether it is for events as a convening company, or just bringing people back to the office with purpose. Yes, there are some bosses and some organizations that will say, you got to come back five days a week or three days a week, and that's the way it's going to be. However, the most insightful won't be approaching it that way. So you said the need to move from experiential to transformational. That makes sense, but oh my God, that's really hard to do, Rebecca. Hard, it is hard. And and remember, there's a client on the other end of this, so they don't, they, you know, their threshold and tolerance is very different than mine. My perspective and and what I challenge my team to do is listen. Everyone came out of COVID transformed, whether they know it or not, with a new perspective on how they want to lead their lives, which impacts the workforce and impacts how we how we go to work and how we participate and with that comes events and office spaces and all of these things and the reality is people want to convene in a very different way and they need it to be it's not even they want it they need it to be whether they know it or not they need to if they're going to engage that way they want to go to an office that's going to support them and both personally and professionally that that barrier of like this is why I'm at the office versus, you know, after seeing your dog and your kids and all of this in the back of your Zoom screen, I remember one of my kids came in one day, I'm on this big, important thing, you know, dropped the F-bomb. And I'm like, really? You're terrible, but now I look like a terrible person. But you realize very quickly, it took the barriers down. We're dressing more casually or more sort of in our personal styles. People, people want to be supported. People want to be changed. People want to be aligned with organizations, events friend networks, cohorts that are going to move them, not just inform them. They want to be moved and, 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 and feel like they're contributing to something bigger than themselves. And again, I'm not sure that everyone is conscious of that, but I do really believe that is sort of the vibe that we're feeling and seeing and the energy that is out there. And, and I feel so strongly about that personally. And it's always been a, a mantra for the company. And in fact, it's our tagline, right? We transfer lives through the power of events. And I really, really believe that and connect to that. And that is why I get up every day and do what we do. And that's why you bring a lot of value to your clients, Rebecca, but it is really important because this requires both a different mindset yeah. and a different skill set. So first and foremost, it requires for people to approach gatherings, approach convenings differently, a very different mindset. And then a recognition that it requires a different skill set to make this work. You also mentioned facilitation rather than the people on stage. That's a very different skill set than what most of the people that have convened in the past uh, are comfortable with. So it requires different mindset and different skill set to be able to transition events and convenings into this future that you're talking about. 
And, and I've had to do a lot of work around that, not only reading, I just finished the executive uh, coaching program at Georgetown, and I'm looking at the facilitation program. We work with a lot of facilitators and bring in a lot of experts around this. And for me, I'm not trying to become the facilitator as much as just trying to understand the language around it in order to help our clients, because you're right, it's scary. And, and there are, and we're still doing events that are what they used to be. And I, you know, while I can say it till I'm blue in the face, you know, people have to experience little moments in order to get really comfortable diverting their current budget to sort of this new format. And it requires more work to, to prepare both the clients, the, the, all the stakeholders um, to, to understand how this is going to work. And you have to re-educate your participants as well as to how they're going to engage in the process. So, you know, it is a very big consultative piece of what we do. And I've had to bring on people with that expertise in the company, as well as challenge my um, kind of events team to sort of expand their universe, both through reading, through courses, through exposure, to thinking about not just the logistics and the creative and the sort of the technology around this, but actually what is the kind of, it's both context and content, right? There's the context is equally as important. What does that container look like in order to really facilitate and that's from everything from, you know, temperature and sound to set up to how we draw people out. What an outstanding opportunity, though, uh, for, again, all organizations to reflect on their convening and how they would do things differently. And that's part of what you do in working with clients as you help them plan their convenings. Uh, I think part of the challenge will be with the mindset and the skill set is that people need to let go of the way things worked in the past. And at least in my interactions, Rebecca, with some of the senior leaders that I guide and coach, many of them ha have a very hard time. So their people get it a lot more. Their people are the ones that want to go into an environment and want to be engaged, want facilitation, want that transformation. But the leaders still want the script <laughs> to be the way it was a couple of years ago. And part of what I have to push them on is exactly what you said, that that is no longer acceptable. They can shove that food down people's throats just for so long before losing the engagement if not fully losing their team members. And you're seeing that now outside of convenings. I mean, just look at people who are forcing their teams to come back to work, right? People are quitting. People don't wanna be a part of that. Those are toxic cultures now. Those aren't cultures with sort of progressive leadership anymore. And, and it's a problem. And, you know, this, so I, I think the momentum is such that there's people who are, in that change maker space that are kind of really pushing on it, but there's enough momentum just at all levels that is gonna just force it. And, um, and, and it'll impact people's ROI at the end of the day, which will, is always a motivator to make change. You know? But I think there's other things afoot that will help. So on the business side, Rebecca, if we uh, speak with each other five, 10 years down the line uh, and you believe that you've been able to take your organization to the next level. What will Lindner Global be doing for its clients? That's a great question. This is where I spend all my time and I'm most excited, especially coming out of COVID. So for me, you know, the giving back piece and that sort of legacy of service is somewhat new for me, probably this is part of that transformation that I've gone through personally and reflection, you know, I was kind of running a business and trying to just pay the bills and support my family and support my team's families and all of that and service our clients. But really for me, my goal is to be able to give back in a myriad of ways. So we're, we're creating new products to help our industry. Um, coming out of COVID, we helped create with a group of founders, um, the DC Event Coalition. And while that's kind of just as a way to support our industry over uh, the time frame that COVID was happening, but it really made me realize how much I want to be able to give back. Um, we're creating a pro bono program, we're create, which we've had for some time, but we're really kind of making that a much bigger, uh, to have bigger impact. Um, 
uh, we're looking at creating a foundation in the future where we can support organizations and young people who are trying to sort of move through this career path and in a way that's really meaningful. I'd like to start creating our own events um, and, that, and not have them just, you know, we'll continue to service clients and, and expand that, but I'd like to create a, a, a universe where we're actually creating our own impactful events that we own. Um, so there's a very bright and exciting future ahead for us, which will include a lot of giving back to the communities that we operate in. Um, and I'm very excited about it. And to me, that's where I'm drawing the most juice. And it, what a wonderful way to get additional meaning and purpose out of the experience we've gone through to both find better ways for convening uh, people and giving back to the community. Because I think the the connections, the human connection yeah. is really important to all of us and we need more of it than we've ever needed before. We just need it done with intention and purpose. So just saying, we're going to bring people together, 200 people are gonna be in a room, that's not good enough. So that's not human connection, just the fact and, that there are 200 people around. And this draws, I mean, it's so interesting too, because that draws exactly on the full arc of my life to this day, right? I started, you know, here I was born in West Africa and I have this huge network of cultural connection and, you know, and this web of, how I've led my life coming to this sort of point now in this inflection point where I'm like, oh no, I want to draw on all of that in order to exactly as you say is I'm a bridge for human connection. And that's how I look at my company now, which is not how I looked at it before. And that's where that transformation piece comes in. And, and it, it's a reflection of who I am and how I've lived my life and now how I see myself going forward. What beautiful branding and messaging, the bridge for human connection. I love that. <laughs> there it is. You nailed it. <laughs> I can so, now fire my marketing company. <laughs> you, are, you are a great marketer yourself and you know that, Rebecca. So, Rebecca, if you were to give advice to your younger self and younger leaders based on your journey of ups and downs in establishing your company and growing it over the years, including through COVID. What uh, advice would you give? You know, it's so consistent for me now, because as I reflect back, I mean, I was pushing so hard on trying to, you know, show up as this person I actually wasn't yet. And while I, I think that's important, right? You need to have aspiration and you need to sort of be the person you want to be. But to do that well, you need to ask for help. And you need to cultivate mentors and participate in cohorts. And I really was afraid and didn't feel good enough and was afraid of sort of the no that I might get. And I look back now and realize as people make that request of me, I mean, I am so excited to help and give back. And I sit on boards and I you know, I'm part of advisory, I'm part of just one-on-one -on -one mentoring, and I realized so quickly that had I asked for that and participated in that, it's not that it would have accelerated my business, because, but what it would have done, which would have impacted the business, is it would have accelerated me and my emotional capacity, my spiritual capacity, my intellect, my business acumen in a way that then would have really truly transformed. And in order to make something grow, you have to grow. And and, and you do that by reaching out and asking for that help and, and investing in that and seeing that as important. And that is the advice I would give. What great, great advice, Rebecca. I uh, interviewed Professor Vanessa Bonds. She's a professor of organizational behavior at Cornell, has written an outstanding book uh, called You Have More Influence Than You Think. And one of the things she says in there is that we vastly underestimate people's willingness to help us, even for extreme requests. And she's done studies with uh, people asking others for their cell phone, even when they don't know them on the street, or all kinds of extreme things, having them vandalize books. But part of the point that she makes is that people want to help. In many instances, we in our own minds come up with reasons why they would not say yes to us. 
and they won't. So that's a great piece of advice in that it's our challenge to overcome our fear and ask for that help from others. Uh, it's a great way for us to develop ourselves. In addition to that, are there any leadership resources or practices you typically find yourself recommending, Rebecca? You know, I, you know, I'm an avid reader. I read probably or listen to about average about two and a half books a week. So I'm a really, really, and I listen to it on like top speed, but that's my own sort of ADD kicking in probably. Um, so that's one. Um, you know, there are groups that I belong to, you know, um, or, or I'm familiar with like EO, Vistage. Um, you know, I'm a part of a, an organization called Conscious Leadership Group. Um, you know, I meditate. I'm a daily meditator. And again, this is a person who used to be like meditation. That's so weird. <laughs> and now it's, you know, I do a lot of breathing exercises, you know, and I really support myself in many, many ways in, you know, externally and internally in order to become the best version of myself as both leader, as parent, as human. Um, and, um, you know, so I think constantly recommitting always to your own personal growth um, is really the way to do it. And there's just, there's no one way, there's a million ways to do it and, and people need to find their path, but there's tons of resources out there. But cohorts are one, reading is a great one and it's so accessible to everyone. There's no barrier to that. And then just self-care. I, those are those are all outstanding perspectives, starting out with, as you mentioned, even coming out of COVID, the necessity for you as a leader of a team to uh, uh, take care of yourself without uh, you taking care of yourself. You will not have the ability to take care of others, whether it's through meditation or whatever works for you. Yep. And then the opportunity to learn and grow whatever way works for you is it um it could be listening it could be cohorts it could be different opportunities i really appreciate rebecca you taking the time to share your leadership journey and your leadership insights most especially because as you have gotten to become more of your authentic self you have a tremendous ability to give back to others and I am thrilled with your insights on how to make convenings work. You are doing that both professionally with the organization and looking to contribute more to the community through that, because I think that is something we all need desperately, powerful, effective convenings for human connection. Really appreciate your leadership your perspectives and you taking the time to share your life journey. Thank you so much, Rebecca Linder. Oh, Mahan, it's such a privilege and an honor to talk to both you and to, and I hope there's some value here for, for the audience as well. And just know that it is my greatest gift to serve. And I feel so strongly about that. And I'm very open if there's other ways I can do that, that people see, I, I look forward to hearing uh, about how best to do that. But it is my greatest intention.